Baldur's Gate 3, the game that conquered our hearts and minds. Let's talk about it, but first, a quick orientation. Ah, the child of Baal has awoken. You can think of Baldur's Gate as a coming-of-age story, but not of a character, but rather of the RPG medium. That sounds pretentious. Basically, every game in the franchise contributed an idea of some sort. The original came out in 1998, and it too was a breakthrough. Back then, the dominant strain of RPG was a first-person dungeon crawler. These days, we call them blobbers. Back then, they were simply called role-playing games. But it turns out a first-person perspective might not be the best fit for what is essentially a tactical game with multi-unit control. Dungeon crawlers ruled the 80s and the early 90s, but with the success of isometric games, blobbers were on their way out. Baldur's Gate is like a cat you see. We love it, but it is a murderer. Glorious murder. But good as it was, the game had problems. Uh, small problems, hardly worth mentioning. The characters were gimmicks with close to no development. Some quests were offered and accepted automatically without any player input. The combat system was broken by kiting. The text felt AI-generated, even though language models won't be invented for another 20-something years. Like I said, uh, small problems. Moving on. The year 2000. Baldur's Gate 2. <laughs> I have a question. Which one of the classic RPGs do you think was the most influential? Was it Fallout? Was it Ultima Underworld? <gasps> was it Planet Alcatraz? There is a strong case to be made that the most influential classic RPG was Baldur's Gate 2. Many of the features that we love or hate in the Mass Effects, the Dragon Ages and Quartors can be traced to this game. Binary moral choices, player strongholds, followers playing a significant narrative role, companion side quests, romances, the DNA of Shadows of Am is, uh, everywhere. Now, skipping ahead a bit, in 2012, the Canadian developer Beamdog released Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition, a remaster of the first game. This was followed by the 2016 expansion Siege of Dragonspear. That's 18 years after the release of the original. Video games have changed. Back in the year 2000, the revenue of the video game industry was around $8 billion. In 2009, it was just under $20 billion. In 2016, it was $91 billion. This hobby used to be for nerds. Now, it's for everyone. Even the way we think about games has changed. We learned that individual games can be thought of as mediums, with their own code of structural elements, mechanics, visual and writing styles. And we also learned that we are quite bad at deciphering this code. The new content added by Beamdog ended up clashing with the original in a way that was noticeable. It felt like a modding project from a decade ago. The peril follows you like pestilence. The story of the progeny of the God of Murder was concluded in the 2001 Throne of Baal expansion that featured little or but no wilderness exploration, consisting instead of a series of dungeons, each with a boss battle in the end. But while the structure can be criticized, the content itself was good, and the most memorable part was the game introducing, or reintroducing, the best companion character in the franchise. What if we were to return to Baldur's Gate together? What would people say, do you think? <laughs> and now, 22 years later, we'll be accepting Sarivox's offer. Baldur's Gate 3 uses the clever system from Original Sin 2. We can create a blank character or play as one of our companions, with their side story becoming our personal story. And there is also something called Dark Urge, which is a special character who has amnesia and is tormented by violent thoughts. This is who I'll be picking. Larian made some fantastic games over the years, but they never truly worked for me because of their tone. The Larian Whimsy. I thought perhaps this can be circumvented by playing as a misanthrope, but it turns out it's a complete non-issue. The tone of Baldur's Gate 3 is very different from that of Original Sin. I'll be playing a rogue and taking some ranger and fighter levels later. <laughs>
The idea is to make a character who specializes at dealing the maximum amount of damage on turn one. The game asks us to create the Guardian. We are not given any context for this, no explanation of who this character is or what's their role in the story. It's intentional. You're supposed to be a little confused. This is a nautiloid, a spell jamming ship, Mind Flayer technology. A spell jammer is a type of vessel that can travel both between the planes of existence but also in space. The prosperous port city of Baldur's Gate, on the Sword Coast. The inhabitants are being harvested by space aliens. They used to be a vast illithid star empire that ruled many worlds in the Sea of Night. It was destroyed by a slave rebellion. The Githyanki are a race of former illithid slaves, sworn to hunt down their former masters anywhere. Jumping between planes won't save you, squid. Mind flayers reproduce by infecting other individuals with a parasite. That must be the reason for the kidnappings. Infected with a mind flayer tadpole, we escape the pod and explore the alien vessel. The adventure begins. Body horror seems like a strange way of opening this, but uh, Baldur's Gate 2 also had elements of body horror in its opening, although they were mostly communicated via text. The ship, the Nautiloid, is flying full speed through one of the Hell Dimensions. And this would be Leia Zell, our future space lizard GF. Individuals infected by the parasite can partially read each other's thoughts, and this conveniently allows us to skip a lot of boring exposition. Combat is now turn-based. There is a simultaneous turns feature, but it's rarely used in practice. I suppose that's fine. Every individual action feels like it matters and needs to be communicated clearly. But it does get annoying in some of the later fights when the turn queue is populated by a dozen plus entities. Here is something I thought was very clever. Pressing the ALT key highlights some interactive objects and containers, but not others. You'll have to pay attention to the world around you. I've always wondered what would happen if you take a classic RPG formula and supercharge it with AAA resources. We don't have a reliable number yet, but it's safe to assume that the budget for this game is at least a hundred million. That's a low estimate, it's likely much more. For comparison, the budget for the well-received throwback RPG Wasteland 3 was around seven million. Get me out of this Shadowheart, the cleric with a suspicious name, becomes our second companion. She also has a parasite. How long do we have before we turn a lithid? We should visit a brain doctor. The ship is being boarded by hell demons. Our illithid master commands us to fight our way to the helm and activate the jump drive. The final battle of the opening segment. We have a limited number of turns to accomplish this. If you kill the large demon, you get his sword. I've heard the Forgotten Realms described as generic fantasy. Nothing can be further from the truth. Welcome to Act 1. Dramatis Personae. The Demon People. A drow she-Nazi. Nautiloid survivors. Goblins. This guy. And we'll be killing them all. But not like right now. Structurally, this game turned out to be very similar to the original. In Act 1, we'll be exploring wilderness areas and caves. Act 2 is about dungeons, both above ground and traditional. Act 3 is urban exploration. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. The first thing we should do is populate all our follower slots. In the Infinity Engine games, the maximum party size was 6. In this, it's 4. I'm alive. How is this possible? The truth about the world is that anything is possible. The game assigns a supply value to most food and drink type of items. They are resources used for resting and replenishing your HP and abilities. Meet Astarion the Rogue. What did you? and those tentacled freaks do to me. Astarion is a fellow worm haver, so we can use our telepathy to get him up to speed. Lazel being trapped in a cage is a clever tutorial on using weapons to interact with physics objects. 
My people possess the cure for this infection. Last time I was this impressed by facial animations was back during the Bloodlines era. Furthermore, Saurus is the best engine ever made. Ch the narrator does a great job of also being a character. This is the thing that abducted you. You could end its life here and now, if only you didn't feel compassion. Compassion? Nope, swing and a miss. Scratch that from the to-do list. Gale, the wizard stuck on the other side of the fast travel portal, is a potential companion. A hand? I've read in a spoiler that if you take Gale, you'll eventually get to meet Elminster, the annoying Mary Sue of the realms who doesn't seem to understand the concept of personal space. It is my mission to try to kill Elminster in every game he's in. The Dark Urge character gets an option to prevent an unwanted social interaction by chewing off Gale's stuck hand. You were supposed to lend a hand, not take one. Yeah, go on. Make fun of my neurodivergence. You! Not another step, hear me? Our first battle against a rival adventury party. These were the highlight of the Infinity Engine games. <laughs> Baldur's Gate 1 was praised for its encounter design, which indeed was brilliant if you compare it to the old dungeon crawlers. Many games back then simply didn't do encounter design. But to be real with you, the original Baldur's Gate had a ridiculous amount of filler combat, and I'm glad to see this is no longer the case. There are no filler battles anymore. No more trash mobs spawning in the fog of war. Everything is hand-placed and deliberate. Shadow heart seems jumpy. Another welcome change is dialogue writing. Everything is beautifully concise now. There are no text dumps. Exposition is done via visual means. In fact, there is no descriptive text at all. The narrator makes it redundant. This approach is pretty much the opposite of how it was in the Infinity Engine games. These are the names of gods. So, uh, what are we foreshadowing here? The last three names in this book sit close together but are so devastated by the scroll as to be unreadable. An educated guess, Merkel, Bane, Baal, the Dead Three. Originally a group of mortal adventurers, they traveled to the Grey Waste and met Jergal, the final scribe and the god of the dead. Jergal was bored of his job and willingly gave up his portfolio to the Three. Bane ruled tyranny and strife, Baal became the god of murder, and Merkel was the lord of the dead. Withers the Skeleton is a utility character that offers a respec service for a trivial sum of gold. We wake him up while exploring a micro dungeon. What a curious way to awaken. He'll be chilling in our camp. The central conflict of Act 1 is a war between the tiefling refugees hiding in a druid fortress and the nemesis, an army of goblins led by a Nazi elf. Damnable roach! Will is a companion. Provoke the blade. And suffer its sting. A cool introduction to what is basically a trivial tutorial battle designed to familiarize you with a variety of goblin-related creatures. There are children here, you fool! Inhabited by tieflings, humans, and shape-shifting druids, the fort is the game's first town-type location. The community is quite dysfunctional. I'm sure you know the stories. Doomed to shed our skin and become a lithid. Will looks like a rogue-ish type, but he is actually a warlock who stuck a bargain with the devil, a bargain from which he longs to break free before it consumes his soul for good. Welcome to the Brainworms Brotherhood. The goblins seem to be worshipping an entity called Absolute. I want to interrogate the prisoner. Looks like the Absolute sent me a protector. Intelligence check failure. Uh-oh. I am not reloading this. Sorry, this wasn't supposed to be a rescue. I just fucked up a roll. Priestess go, patch us up. Interesting. She says there is a doctor at the goblin place. I've changed my mind. This is a rescue. When a guard spots us escorting a goblin, we get an opportunity to talk our way out of a fight via a dialogue check of our choice. Something similar happens when we make a social faux pas, like uh, take somebody else's stuff. But there are quite a few guards, so quite a few checks, and unless you save scum, eventually you'll have to kill a tiefling or two. <laughs> or five. We also killed the druid trader who was acting all cop-like all of a sudden. All the best items he sells are found on the body. 
And do we get away with it all? Absolutely, yes. If you kill isolated groups, the rest of them won't know what happened. Good to be free again, gotta say. Do you by any chance have a dry cleaner at the Goblin Town? Those diminutive scales of yours look like mistakes. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You know what? Whatever. Tired of your babbling. We should make camp. The camp scene functions kind of like the Ibn Hawk from the Knights of the Old Republic. It's a home area where we can store extra items and talk to our companions. And it's also where the game develops some of its secondary storylines. A tiefling wants to join our court. She's a bard. Fine, that might be useful. And I know when I'm being led down a dark path. If you make too many decisions a party member disagrees with, they'll leave. No Blade of the Frontiers content for bad people. You have a manner of irresistible desperation about you. I like it. Asterion, surprisingly, is very dependable and can be relied upon. You open your eyes with a lurch. And you are not in your bed. The Dark Urge story event. The bard was with us for a total of two minutes. This is still basic introductory stuff. It'll get way creepier. In lumbering style, you have gotten away with murder. For the 20th time today. The statue of Saloon, the goddess of the moon, rival of Shar, who is the goddess of night. You want the truth? Fine. Shadowheart reveals that she is a cleric of Shar, and her domains are death, trickery, and lying to the protagonist. Traveling with a Sharite is a tradition in these games. Well, fuck me. It's you from the Nautiloid. Karlak is an augmented tiefling super soldier. The Blade of the Frontier's personal quest is connected to her, but since he turned out to be uncool, she'll be traveling with us instead. Being a barbarian, she hits like a truck, as the paladins hunting her will learn shortly. <laughs> At night, we are tormented by murderous thoughts. Ah, oh, we should go for a walk, clear our head. Me lord, jubilant day. I have found your vile self at last. Past me sure kept a strange company. Your loyal and ever adoring butler. Before departing, the butler gives us a magical item. The cape is powerful, but it looks very stupid, so I'm not wearing it. The goblin we rescued bugged out, failing to get us access to the base HQ. So we'll have to talk our way inside. As the symbol glows, power courses through you. Brain worm havers are a privileged class compared to the common cultists, such as this goblin. The parasite makes the lesser cultists obey us, and it makes us obey the absolute. I thought the artifact was an element of the companion's side quest, but no, it's a story critical item that helps us resist the absolute's influence. I wonder how this plays out without Shadowheart in the party. Guard Gargon, level 4. No go inside, inside. He's more like a vibes guard. Turns out the goblin camp is a social location with tons of content. Play football with a chicken. Solve puzzles. Participate in necromantic rituals. Steal artifacts from the treasury. Make friends with a BDSM priest. Randomly kill isolated goblins for XP. Well done. You humiliated a goblin. Let's go. The real reason we are here is to see their doctor. So drink this. It'll purify ya. That's not suspicious at all, but I trust our physician. Alas, Goblin Healthcare leaves something to be desired. She is still better than a Soviet dentist. Easier to escape from, too. It's not our concern. Our prey is elsewhere. This is Minthara the Hitleress. There is a weapon the Absolute seeks. The weapon is the artifact Shadowheart carries. Time to liquidate our vast loot reserves. You recognize the crest she bears. The winged serpent of the Zentarim. The Zentarim are an international mafia of the realms. The nations of Faerun have local thieves' organizations, but the Zents operate everywhere. Few know this little trick, but a merchant will give you all their best items for free. All you have to do is interact with them with a bladed object. <laughs> 
a bunch of goblin kids are throwing rocks at a shape-shifted druid. The game loves humanizing exotic or evil creatures by introducing the children versions of them. Well, perhaps humanizing is a wrong word. When in Rome... He initiates combat and even kills one of the mini-goblins. Interesting that this is even possible. Later I would learn that this individual is a companion. I regret nothing. I wish I could time travel back to Baldur's Gate 2 and kill their druid as well. And when we go to bed, we are visited by an orc spirit. I came just in time. You are transforming. Are you me from the future? I'll protect you. This is one of the more confusing plot elements in this game. I don't believe it's possible to figure out this character until we are explicitly revealed who this is much later. The Guardian shows us a corpse of a god floating in an astral plane. Been there, done that. And no, I do not believe this is a reference to Marvel anything. Back in the Material Plane, the drow is about to march her goblin horde on the druid fort. We told her where it was. The tadpole. It's turned you, hasn't it? It was only a matter of time. Interesting opinion. But there is one small problem. I planted a bomb somewhere in your house. Tread lightly. I think there's something I should tell you. Nothing big or terrible. Just a small little detail about me that... <laughs> hasn't come up naturally. <laughs> you are a vampire. Ever since he was infected with a tadpole, normal vampire rules no longer seem to apply. Sunlight doesn't hurt him. He can enter somebody's house without permission. Given our group's nature, I don't see much harm. We're each monsters in the making, after all. <laughs> I love the camera jumping between characters. I guess the term for that is cinematography. Cinematography and Baldur Gates. You know what? We are all gonna make it. <laughs> Been like an hour since I last killed a goblin. Back in the fort, the demon people are preparing for war. We threw them back once. If you're with us, perhaps we can do it again. So, about that. <laughs> By the time the goblin army arrived, we already mopped up the remaining tieflings. The drow Hitleress discovers a bunch of civilians hiding in a cave. This is the game's equivalent of the no Russian scene. You can choose not to partake, but she will execute all of them by herself. Praise the absolute. She will reward us well. The total absence of background music makes this scene feel uncomfortably intimate. The woman telepathically communicates her intention to fuck us. All important Absolutians appear to have parasites. The Drow society is dominated by women. The Hitleress is aggressive and direct, which seems to be normal for them. As you approach your camp, the raucous celebrations have already begun. The changes to the camp are not permanent. The game has three acts, and we are only halfway through Act 1. New mechanic, we can intentionally consume illithid brainworms we find in the game world. Consume is the word the game uses, but basically we can add more parasites to ourselves to gain powers. We can also do this to our companions, although most of them are not open-minded. You know... If that parasite isn't to your taste... Asterion is the exception. He loves brain worms. I'm not going to be showing the sex scene, but basically it involves a drow priestess blowing a dragon man. And in the process, she lets her guard down, both physically and, more importantly, mentally. This provokes our past self into resurfacing. You draw her closer with all the vim of a lover's first embrace. Wow, even for me this is... So we killed three companions and two more left us for ethical reasons. Ah, well, nevertheless. Maybe there are friends waiting for us in the Underdark. This is not a separate act or anything. Moving between the caves and the surface world is instantaneous, thanks to the game's fast travel system. We'll be going back and forth a bunch of times. My, my, 
What manner of place is this? It's possible to meet Raphael much earlier, but I think it's funnier to wait a little for the story to progress so that the main character gets confused thinking he's someone from our past life, like the goblin butler. This is the House of Hope, Raphael's mansion in Avernus, one of the Hell Dimensions. What's better than a devil you don't know? <laughs> a devil you do. The game is setting up a bunch of things to be referenced later in the main quest. Once we exhaust all possibilities of getting cured, we can make a deal with Raphael. And you're hardly bland. Your scent alone is enough to make my neck sweat. Lazel, baby, please read the room. The body of my drow axe is still warm. And speaking of romance... As you approach, a guttural scream and a succession of quick bangs rattle the door. Leave it. Whoever's inside doesn't want an audience. And I don't want to fight. Come on, I can't not open this door. What the hell are you doing? I've always wondered what that looked like. I've come to sate you and be sated. The companions are not actually supposed to be this horny. The approval thresholds are bugged. That's what the devs say. A dragon's heart beats inside you. Going by the dialogue options, the dragon people are very clannish and assertive, just like the Githyanki. If we demonstrate these qualities to Leia Zell, she'll be impressed. Interesting fact about her species. They don't actually need a partner to have offspring. Githyanki lay eggs and they can do so asexually. Speaking of exotic races, my conids, what, the mushroom people, have a town here underground. A proper social location with quests, traders, and a hobgoblin scientist. My colleagues and I are working to improve conditions in the Underdark. A worthy goal, IMO. It is impressive that Larian managed to make a cavern level so visually stunning. The scientist says a local doctor can help us with our condition. This adventurer has an illithid tadpole. It's brilliant how excited this man is. He truly fucking loves science. No ceramorphosis. That's impossible. Illithids are normally controlled by an elder brain in the heart of their colony, but rogue illithids do exist. They still need to consume brains bi-weekly. Omellum claims he made a deal with a lich. The illithid gets the brains and the lich the souls. Clever. He says he'll help us brew an illithid abortion potion, but we'll have to travel around and gather ingredients. I show you a memory. The primary narrative in this corner of the Underdark is the conflict of the Mushroom People and the Dark Dwarves. The Sovereign proposes we kill them all with chemical weapons. A little genocidal, but effective. No offense to the Shroom, but that sounds overcomplicated. It's best to kill them with normal weapons. There aren't even that many of them. <laughs> We steal the Duergar ship to explore the second half of the Underdark. Underrail Expedition. And these guys are the Coast Guard, I guess. Where's Gek? Who are you? You might have heard of me. Calvin Barkmore broke every record they keep track of. The ship battle is fun as hell, and it's the first fight in this game where I actually had to use a wide array of items and abilities, playing blind on medium. The statues of Shar, the goddess Shadowheart worships. She is everywhere in this game. Dead hoon walking, seems like. This area is the ruin of an ancient temple that serves as a base for Dwerger slavers. The Drow Master, a fellow true soul parasite haver, got himself trapped inside a ruin and wants to be rescued. He literally calls us via warm telepathy FaceTime. But this is a big area with tons of things to do besides working for the Drow. We'll be shagged to Shanatar. Shit's looking up. This is a quote-unquote cursed amulet that makes you laugh. Telepathic mushrooms. Walking brains. It's all so comical. Duergar racists, ancient robots, gnome suicide bombers. Set me free! I ain't 
they parley with more twat souls. All right, time to convert the dwarves into experience points. But how do we do this in the most efficient way possible? Well, it begins with rescuing near the drow. Nier does not the plan is to trick Nier into killing many, preferably all his servants, making it easier for us to kill him and extract his parasite. I decided I collect them now. Me and mine worked flat out. I was cracking the whip day and night. Tell him, true soul. I've never seen this woman before in my life. This worked even better than I hoped when a Duegar archer gets a lucky crit on Nier, pushing him into lava. The problems in this game solve themselves. The book is locked tight with no visible keyhole. The first ever book that sucks your dick. I.e. the first ever book that is good. After completing a series of increasingly hard skill checks, we get a new feat. What profane knowledge is now seared inside of you you should never have known. Omalum finally brews an abortion portion, but it doesn't work. Instead of killing the parasite, it seemed to make it stronger. Omalum, are you well? That lava is like nothing I have ever observed before. Oh well, it was always a long shot. Moving on. Stop wasting time, Beretta. The Gith are searching for the artifact that protects us from the Absolute. It might even be the reason they attacked the Nautiloid in the first place. Ryder, my time is short. Lead me to... Shh, shh, shh. Such a familiar tone. Screw up this dialogue and you'll have to fight the Githyanki patrol, although the Dragon Rider won't participate. In order to advance the plot, we need to reach the main base of the Absolute Cult. This can be done either by going through the Underdark or via the Mountain Pass. But nothing is preventing us from exploring both areas, there is no actual time limit. The ruin in front of us is the Temple of Lathander, the god of the rising sun. The Githyanki base is in the dungeon below. You are infected! A gig thrall is something to eradicate, not reason with! The faithful may be purified. This is Vlakith's protocol. Lazel says they have a larva removing device, but something tells me the story doesn't want us to part with a parasite yet. That would be Vlakith the Lich Queen that consorts with dragons and devours her subjects once they reach a certain level in order to increase her own power. Vertical incision from pineal eye to end of notochord. The doctor has a trustworthy face. Too bad she's an absolute psycho. You can tell by looking at the device she created, the larva extractor made of flesh and metal. The purpose of the machine is not to remove tadpoles, it's to collect the memories of the infected before killing them. Another false trail. This is where the plot gets a little hard to follow. The Inquisitor in charge of this place demands we surrender the artifact, and he refuses to take no for an answer. So we kill him. This makes us noticed by the Lich Queen. Vlakith ruled her people for over a thousand years. She is powerful. Be rude to Vlakith and she will wish you out of existence, ending the game. The Lich Queen orders us to travel inside the Astral Prism and kill the entity inhabiting it. Curious that the Guardian also talks to our companions in their dreams, but something tells me they don't see the same Orc woman. I told you to stay away from the Githyanki. But you just couldn't help yourself. She says that it's Vlakith who is bad. The Lich Queen is a fraud who is incapable of preventing the re-emergence of the Illithid Star Empire. But is this a problem we really have? Kaleer prepared me. Only the heaviest souls soar to the astral. This sequence of events breaks Lazel's brain. She rationalizes it as an elaborate trial. Vlakith must be testing her. We need to exterminate all the Githyanki in the temple who are not pure. There are two ways of doing this, the boring one and the funny one. Underneath the Inquisitor's room there is an undisturbed vault. Inside, an artifact of immense power.
It's also a trap. We are locked behind an impenetrable field. The power crystals generate a beam of light that shoots through the portal, charging a super laser located in the temple exterior. The laser points at the ruin itself, and the countdown starts. In four turns, this place is gonna blow up. I use the scroll of dimension door to escape the trap, and then run through the portal. Geth Yankee Best day of my life. Also, the last day of my life. It's hard to escape the blast this powerful. This entire sequence is easily circumvented by inserting a special key we found in the ruins. The challenge is actually remembering that you have it. The mace is a plus three anti-undead weapon that makes act two much easier. But it also means that we'll have to solve our gith problem via manual labor. Entry. There is a cool encounter against a Githyanki instructor and his students, and we get to kill the mad scientist. But overall, this is the only part of the game that kind of dragged for me. A bunch of these fights felt copy-pasted. This was the one instance when I actually missed the old-style combat. RTWP means real-time with pause. It's the type of combat we had in the Infinity Engine games. They didn't invent it, but they sure popularized it. In fact, it's one of their more influential ideas that haunted everything RPG-adjacent for about a decade, producing multiple barely playable and now-forgotten RTWP, Jagged Alliance, and XCOM clones. This style works quite well in games with small parties facing a small number of threats, like in Knights of the Old Republic or Dragon Age. These days, more and more developers seem to be moving away from real-time with pause into turn-based. And I suppose it's a good change, but part of me will always miss the old style for sentimental reasons, even though I don't think I've ever truly enjoyed it. After dark, a visitor comes to our camp. Voss is the dragon rider we met earlier, but he is actually an anti vlakith anarchist, deep undercover. Voss knows about the entity inside the artifact and its powers, but refuses to reveal their identity to us. If they have not said, they must have good reason, and I won't be the one to betray them. We'll meet him in Baldur's Gate when it's time, but it's not where we're going. Beyond the mountain pass are the shadow-cursed lands. The themes of the second act are very different. Glorious murder. Dramatis Personae, a bad man who knows our secret, his loyal henchman. A classmate you haven't seen in a decade. You want a bone? Fish! Flesh-eating shadows. <laughs> There is a dialogue option to order the goblin to go check on the dog. So you want me to... I mean, I'll just... Curious. I have eight points in charisma, and yet everyone always does as I say. No! RPGs are a fraud. In order to penetrate deeper into the darkness, we need a guide. I hear them, your majesty, calling us. Sex with a bear. But what about... They should stay closer, my queen. The group follows the Drider through the dead forest. We are traveling to the Moonrise Towers, the seat of power of the Absolute Cult. Something is wrong. Harpers attack! The Harpers are a secret organization, a uh, secret in air quotes, seemingly dedicated to fighting me in various roly play campaigns. They don't appear to have any other ideology. After dealing with the terrorists, we arrive at the Cult HQ. Not far from the tower is a walled camp, where the cultists assembled an army ready to march on Baldur's Gate. Plot twist. The guard knows who we are. Welcome back, true soul. And that would be the leader of the Absolutists, General Catherick Thorm. Originally a Selunite, turned to Shar worship after a personal tragedy, and then, eventually, to Merkel, a god of the dead. His smirk says everything and nothing at once. I know exactly who you are, and I will never tell. The Dark Urge character was a cultist even before the Parasite. The cutscene goes on for a while. The game wants us to know that Thorm is in charge. <laughs> and that he is immortal.
The army of the Absolute ain't the only thing hidden in the Shadowlands. There is a whole town for us to explore. It's mostly empty. The only remaining residents appear to be non-hostile undead. The doctors here suck shit. The subtitle for Baldur's Gate 3. And on the opposite edge of the map, there is a tavern. An oasis unaffected by the Shadow Curse. Jahira is one of the first companions you get in the original game. This is why we're here, you see. But if there's one thing that we know, it's that it knows its own kind. Now that's gonna be one hell of a persuasion role. Hold on, Jahira. Turns out General Thorm has a spy among the Harpers, who helpfully vouches for us. To your very good health. A drink to loosen our tongue. So, uh, who are you fucking these days? In Baldur's Gate 1, Jahira was a gimmick character. Uh, most of them were. She joins your party together with her husband, Khalid, who is a coward. If none are better. The idea is that she is the one with the balls in this relationship. Jahira was made a bit more complex in the sequel. And here in the third game, since the characters are no longer represented by a static picture, she was given a set of animated gestures and mannerisms. I like it. The reason this place is unaffected by the curse is because of the efforts of Isobel, the priestess of Saloon. The spy man is under orders from the general to kidnap Isobel and bring her to the tower. Come with you. Where? She doesn't know. Let's do this. He doesn't know. They don't know that last night an old friend asked us for a favor. <laughs> The script in here is confusing. I replayed this scene a bunch of times trying to kill them in a different order, but it always ends with the spy flying away with the body of Isobel. At this stage, I didn't know that Isobel was the daughter of Catherick Thorm. What in the nine hells happened? Um... Um... Uh, she fell. With the cleric gone, the shadows consume the Harper's stronghold. Together with the Jahira, we get to kill her former comrades, corrupted by the curse. Killing Harpers with Jahira is something of a tradition in this series. So we did what was asked of us. What happens now? I knew it. This fool is... The Slayer, an avatar form of Baal, Lord of Murder. I believe I understand our role in the story. Uh, sorry for flashing the dragon dick. Did you know that the Baldur's Gate saga had a canon ending? The protagonist, the man named Abdel Adrian, son of the God of Murder, rejected his heritage and retired in the city of Baldur's Gate. Years later, one of Abdel's brothers, everyone thought was dead, came back to confront the hero. The victor of the duo, we don't know who that was, transformed into Slayer and was eventually destroyed by a group of adventurers. Baal's contingency plan worked. With all his mortal children dead, his essence was freed and the god of murder was brought back to life. So I guess he had more children since then. Let's follow in his footsteps. Thou hast now a bosom companion. Withers, the skeleton, lectures us that romance in the workplace is inappropriate. Listen, buddy, friend, fella, my workplace is the realms. Oh, baby, let's make a dragath yaki. Roughly one-third of the second act takes place in a Shar-themed dungeon beneath the town. Our hero thought but a treasure ahead, did not consider the peace of the dead. Raphael has a job for us. One of his rivals, a demon or a devil, made home inside the dungeon. There's a whiff of the surface to you. These creatures talk too much. God of murder, not god of dialogue checks. This is the most challenging battle so far, but there are things we can do to make it easier. Elsewhere in the dungeon, an important ally of General Thorm made his home. Meet Balthazar a necromancy enthusiast. No, it's not the same character from Throne of Baal, but there is a connection. I decided to take his name for myself. I did the same to an EVE Online enemy once. The powerlifter golem is called Flesh. Balthazar says we can borrow him. Simply ring the bell. Flesh is very helpful in the demon fight. So is the Slayer form. Transforming restores all your HP. 
killed him so hard, the corpse glitched out. In the deepest layer of the temple is the gate to Shadowfell, the plane of shadow, thus the name. Nightsong is an Asimar, an offspring of a celestial and a mortal. Venturing to Shadowfell in order to kill Nightsong is the final exam for elite clerics. She always comes back from the dead, so you don't even need to replace her after the deed is done. She also happens to be the reason why Thorm cannot be killed. Balthazar constructed this magical cage to lend her immortality to the general. But the temple outside has been abandoned for more than a hundred years. Nightsong needs to be moved to the towers for safekeeping. Sorry, Balt, but I can't allow you to do that. It should be self-evident that he is a powerful spellcaster, and it makes sense to prioritize Balthazar over the skeleton horde. In order to become one of the Sharite elite, Shadowheart needs to kill Night Song. As is RPG tradition, the game asks for your input. We can influence Shadowheart's future, but I always allow them to make their decisions autonomously. RIP Night Song. Huh. Most Asimar don't actually have immortality powers. Aelin is the daughter of the goddess Selune. To the material plane. The Shadow Cursed Lands. The Harper Outpost. Uh-oh. She doesn't know. Back at the Moonrise Towers, Jahira is on a one-woman crusade. She will actually die if we don't interfere. Unshackled from shadows, she will rise in moonlit glory and carve a path of brightness to the accursed one's second death. So saith the wise Alando. Alando was banned for this post. So saith the wise Alando the seer was a sage from Candlekeep on the Sword Coast. That's not far from here, actually. The second game opens with an Alando quote. The first game opens with a Nietzsche quote for some reason. So, what do you say? Shall we take the final steps together? With each story beat, the fights are getting more and more complex. Finally, I had to use consumables, spell scrolls, take advantage of skill synergies. You might have noticed that until recently, I was wearing the same armor we started the game with. Well, I can't do that anymore. I have to take things seriously. And this is good. A rational difficulty curve. Don't take it for granted. That's certainly not how the old games were designed. In the General's private chambers, we discover a book that reveals much of the game's plot. Everything will be explained organically in the next few minutes, so there is no reason for me to read this, but it's cool that curious players get rewarded with knowledge if they explore this part of the tower early. What have you done? A dick shrinking spell. The cultists were also searching for the artifact, and it was always right under their noses, but he was too busy sneering and smirking. Aelin doesn't know that Isabel was the daughter of Thorm, and he doesn't know that Aelin and Isabel were in a gay marriage, and none of them know that we were the one who killed her. I had to replay this a bunch of times because Jahira kept dying since I couldn't customize her equipment or give her health potions. It shouldn't be much of a surprise that there is an illithid colony below the tower. So it's the Chosen who control the Absolute, not the other way around. There is still about 25 or so hours of gameplay ahead of us. The Illithid Colony. This is where they manufacture the parasites. Even in a place as alien as this, the designers put little things, little details characterizing the way of life of both the enslaved mind flayers and the necromancer specialists who actually run this operation. By the Pondlord. 
It's you! It's not the first time we've visited. The protagonist says he can see a whole fleet of nautiloids, but it seems there were only two, maybe three of them. This is still very impressive, as nautiloids are rare. The illithids seem to have lost the secrets of constructing spell jamming ships. Elsewhere in the dungeon, the stone engraving introduces us to, well, to illithid art for one, but more importantly, to the concept of grand design. <laughs> which is the idea of rebuilding the old illithid star empire, Mind Flayer Irredentism. And here is the rest of the cast. You said it was under control. That's Gortash, a politician from Baldur's Gate, the chosen of Bane, the god of tyranny. Salute, yes. And this is Orin, a shapeshifter, the chosen of Baal, lord of murder, our sister. The Absolute in the Flesh. The brain is controlled via the Crown of Carsus, an ancient artifact created by the most powerful wizard that has ever lived. The conspirators interface with the brain through the Nether Stones. The consensus of three stones is required to command the Absolute. It is time, faithful ones. March on Boulder's Gate. This is an XCOM army. A flying brain, organic spaceships, multi-species troops. The Chosen don't seem to get along, probably already scheming to betray one another. Yes. Each one of the last five battles felt like it could be the final battle of the act, but this is it for real. The trick is to send someone fast to the cage and free the Asimar. Good thing they didn't tadpole her. Night Son joins the battle once again. Lord of Bones, I am here. I am ready. I am yours. I think I killed this guy in Dark Souls 3. Certainly a very impressive introduction for someone who will last two turns against Leazel. Um, Aelin, there is a worm in there I want to extract for my vampire friend. You know what, never mind. She doesn't know. It's better this way. The three amass an illithid army, void of apostolic souls. Withers says illithids don't have souls. So I guess this means they're useless to the gods. Reminds me of old times. Jahira formally joins the group. She starts as a stock druid. You can customize her into whatever. Not being very familiar with D&D 5, I was surprised how much her list of spells resembled that of the AD&D original. Call lightning, dryad summoning, insect swarm. We are so back. Act 2 was quite something, wasn't it? Onwards to Baldur's Gate. The final chapter. Dramatis Personae. Elon Musk. Flaming Fist Rantacops. A common adventurer man. A Baldur's Gate entrepreneur who is completely normal. A Mind Flayer Overlord. A Githyanki Prince who is well cared for in an astral retirement community. What if we return to Baldur's Gate together? What would people say, do you think? <laughs> You have been waylaid by enemies and must defend yourself. Our friend from the artifact needs help. Before you do anything, I am your ally. The true face of our guardian. I did not figure it out prior to now. It was clever of the developers to make us customize their appearance during the character creation. They took advantage of our own creativity to manufacture a lie to trick ourselves with. Well played. A long time ago, an adventurer wandered into the Moonrise Towers, discovered an illithid colony underneath, turned into a mind flare, enslaved by the same elder brain that is now known as the Absolute. Eventually, he escaped its control, 
traveled back to his hometown, fed on criminals and lowlifes, governed a prosperous mercantile operation. They called him the Emperor, so powerful he was. But Elon Musk figured him out. Actually, I invented this mercantile operation. And once again the illithid adventurer was enslaved by the Elder Brain. The Chosen kept calling him the Emperor as mockery. He escaped for the second time when the Absolute sent him to recover the astral prism, which he did. But once the Emperor approached Prince Orpheus, he was free once again, for the Prince was the son of Gith herself and had the power to disrupt hive mind communication. I've always assumed that the method Gith used to break free of mind flayers was a meditation technique, but it seems she had a genetic anomaly that was passed on to her offspring. Like Balthazar exploited Nightson, the Emperor is exploiting Orpheus. He is using his power to protect us we would have been dead without it. Or worse, a slave to the hive mind. Baldur's Gate the city expanded a lot since we last visited uh, several campaigns ago. The army of the Absolute is yet to arrive. Act 3 begins in a big suburb outside the city walls. Feels like this game's version of Barry Ghost. There is plenty to do, plenty to see. Getting killed by doppelgangers is a national pastime of Baldurians. Go away, Orin. Circus of the Last Days, the finest extraplanar circus there is. This place has a ridiculous amount of item and creature assets that are not used anywhere else in the game or are only used once. Accuse the Efreet of cheating and get turned into a cheese wheel. Cheese attack. Oh god, thank you. Enough, Yanis. Listen to yourself. The Phantom Manus looking character is a criminal investigator. 75% of violent crime in Baldur's Gate is committed by doppelgangers. The rest of it? By me. Have you noticed how few dragon people are there in the game? I wonder if we are related to Draconis. Triumph after triumph. This must be a memory of the temple underneath the city. The voice is our goblin butler. When you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Nietzsche always felt kind of goblin-y to me. There is one last piece I've been toying with. Uh-oh. What did it take for you to earn that slayer skin you hide so well? She's putting it together. We should uh, probably leave Jahira at the camp once we discover the temple's location. Access to the bridge to Baldur's Gate is blocked by a mechanized flaming fist unit. Elon Musk invented these, FYI. No matter, there are ways of bypassing the checkpoint. The Bridge District. The new game takes place 120 years after the events of Shadows of Emn. This place has seen more than a century of development. This is the same bridge in Baldur's Gate 1. If I remember correctly, that whole map had like three NPCs. Voss the Dragon Rider wants to make a deal with Raphael to free the being inside the Astral Prism. He is practically begging to sign the contract. Raphael doesn't need anything from Voss, but he needs something from us. The devil temporarily removed the parasite from our brain, a much needed privacy. But it's the one inside the prison that you need, not the illithid. Raphael is in a possession of an artifact called Orphic Hammer. The weapon is capable of shattering the chains that hold Prince Orpheus. And you, Lazel of Kalir, want to free the forgotten prince? Do you not? Naturally she does. Orpheus is the reason we are still alive and autonomous. The Emperor merely channels his power. And his agenda appeared to be a illithid transhumanism. He grew to like his squid body and he wants us to have one too. Did you know that the Emperor can be romanced? There is a scene where he is lying next to us almost naked, making small talk as if this wasn't the weirdest thing to ever happen in any of these games. It's too much. I'm backing off. So the contract. 
What's the catch? In exchange for Orphic Hammer, Raphael wants the Netherese artifact that controls the Elder Brain, the Crown of Carsus. With it, he plans to unite the Nine Hells and become Archdevil Supreme. I like this guy. He would make for an excellent Archdevil. You're too kind. Artifact or not, it's extremely unlikely he would be able to accomplish this. He is a Cambion, which is like a hell version of Asimar. Powerful compared to mortals, but not quite Zariel tier. Sure, I'm in. Irresponsible decisions are why I play RPGs. The master was slain within his own house. They dined on him both, the cat and the mouse. Now that we've got the hammer, it makes sense to say a few words about the items in the economy. Note that I'm by no means an expert on this game. Money was useless in the first two acts, but it became important in Act 3. Everything is crazy expensive, and I don't want to rob merchants out of fear of disappointing Jahira. The game is very conscious of enhancement inflation. Even this late in the campaign, I'm still using some plus one items. My most powerful weapon is plus three. The vast majority the majority of magical items we find seem to be designed to work with a specific ability of a specific class or to allow the user to cast some kind of a spell. The upside of this approach is that you will rarely find items that are obviously best in slot. And the downside is that, well, I felt the need to keep as many of these items around as possible, just in case I'll think of a clever way of using the abilities they provide. As the result, the inventory quickly became a magical garbage dump, impossible to navigate without filtering and the surge bar. Back in Baldur's Gate 1, the individual items had stronger identities, and overall I liked that system a little better. This is the Harper hideout in the Bridge District. Hi, Harper. May Saluna's tears shine on this meeting. It's a code phrase. He's a hostage. There is something familiar about you. Doesn't she remind you of our old friend Marcus? Jahira's meaning is clear. Marcus was the traitor who plotted to kidnap the Catherick's daughter from the Harper base in Shadowlands. She doesn't know. <laughs> Jahira tells the man that he did well, and then immediately fires him from the Harpers. His comrades got tortured and killed while he did the kidnapper's bidding. She is my favorite companion in Baldur Gates 3. How long must we wait here? Things stir to the south as we sit. We went from naive teen Jahira, who was just a bunch of impulses with no development or depth, to stubborn adult Jahira, who has a history in this world. I swear, traveling with you is never dull. And finally to elderly Jahira, who makes unpleasant but important decisions, but doesn't have that youthful energy anymore. She went from this... For the Fallen! ...to this... For the Fallen. A bittersweet arc. Larian did a fantastic job. Jahira has a house here in the city, and these are her children. Some are adult, others very young. A private study, a secret room underneath the study, old artifacts we collected in Athkatla, as well as a scroll detailing an esoteric life-extending druid ritual. Greetings, old friend. Orin told me you were on your way here. But I scarcely believed it. Gortash invites us to his inauguration. The keep is of a recent construction, or at least it wasn't in the original. Stand down, villain. Robot, let me pass. It's my favorite assassin. The Dark Urge guy is an amnesiac main villain. The Dead Three work together as mortals, and it's not uncommon for them to work together as gods or demigods or whatever it is they are now. Orin told me she made a fool of you. And I should have known you wouldn't go down that easy. We were there from the very beginning, scheming with Gortash, stealing the Netherese artifacts, enslaving the Elder Brain. But then we got stabbed in the back. Now the General is dead, and Orin is refusing to cooperate. Commanding the Absolute requires the consensus of all three Nether Stones. Without the consensus, the Elder Brain will break free as soon as it finishes executing the previous order, which was to march on Baldur's Gate to make things worse. The idiot conspirators have been mass-producing parasites and infecting Baldurians for a long time now. There is an army of potential mind flayers inside the city wall. That's why Withers is tagging along. Since aberrations don't have souls, by turning people into illithids, the conspirators are robbing the gods of their soul capital. 
Act 3 is the biggest and the most content rich. We finally get to explore the titular city of Baldur's Gate. The game is still introducing new characters, the companion quests are finalized and their arcs closed. We also meet friends from the olden days. I am Viconia de Vere. Viconia is such a crush. The first character I've ever romanced in an RPG. Had to read a guide on game FAQs. It wasn't intuitive. There is even a new follower. Minsk should be 140-something years old by now. Does anyone ever die in this universe? But there is an explanation. The man spent the last hundred years as a statue. There is no gold in here! He was always a purely comedic character. The jokes were refined in the second game, but uh, nothing about him fundamentally changed. But will be liberally kicked in good measure! It would be funnier if the brain worms actually made Minsk smarter. Anyway, I didn't get the chance to use him much, because the game is about to end. The House of Hope, Raphael's luxurious palace in the Hells, levitating over the wastelands of Avernus. The reason for us being here is either to steal our contract or the Orphic Hammer, depending on the previous choices. The master of the house is coming. But whatever you do, Raphael will be very angry. The former enemy is now working for the devil. Choices and consequences. He RPG'd us. Curtain falls, but hold your applause. Squirm, squirm, for now down here come the claws. Yes, Raphael sings his own theme song. Best character. Fools, fools, how hard you have fought. Brave, brave, but it's all been for naught. True souls that couldn't be bought. Doomed, detected, and caught. Raphael's final act. Well, not if I can help it. I'm reloading. The contract stays in place. Raphael will complete the system of Avernian idealism or whatever his goal was. There are a number of ways of finishing the game, and most of them involve gathering all three nether stones. Dealing with Elon will be easier if we disable his Metal Gear factory. Use terrorism to achieve this. One of the powers Asterion got by consuming the parasites was to charm anyone who attacks him in melee. He got this ability early, but we failed to charm a single character in this entire game until it worked on Gortash just now. There is a side plot involving rescuing the Grand Duke from Gortash underwater prison, but for the Dark Urge character it just feels like busy work. The heart of our story is somewhere else. Sarivok is the villain from the original game and the companion in one of the expansions. Bal's least favorite son. The narrator describes him as spilled stain of father's divine essence left out to dry. Ouch. The Red Spirits are the former members of the Five, a group of elite ball spawn destroyed during the events of Throne of Baal. It seems they returned to Baldur's Gate together. Sarivog was possibly the only child of Baal who was actually intelligent. It would be in his character to eventually grow skeptical of Baalism, but then again, perhaps we should manage our expectations when dealing with Baal spawn. <laughs> When I learned that Sarivok, Jahira, and Minsk were in this game, my plan was to ally with Sarivok and sacrifice the others to close their decades-long character arcs. But after actually meeting Jahira and seeing how she changed and grew, well, perhaps it's time for us to change as well. The game succeeded in something the originals failed to accomplish, and that is convincing me that Baal is an idiot god who is about nothing. But we are not done. This is the Undercity, a maze of ancient ruins beneath Baldur's Gate. You have come home to your royal dwelling. The goblin takes care of the temple, keeps the place clean. The cultists recreationally murder him a few times every day. <gasps> that Saravok's crimson was not yours to spill! And here is our psychotic idiot sister. <laughs> Unfortunately for Orin, pre-buffing is a thing. I had Jahira cast a haste spell. If the rolls were a little better, we could have soloed Orin in one turn. Instead, she lost it too. Some ball spawn disintegrate when killed. Others die normally. It's confusing. <laughs> Our Dark Father possesses the body of the Goblin Butler, murders him, and then talks to us as a reflection in a pool of blood. I come to give you your inheritance. 
TLDR, we are now the top baller, the chosen of the god of relishing in spontaneous murderous urges. Accepting or declining our new role leads to dramatically different story outcomes and rewards. Will you stay with me? After everything we've been through, I don't imagine myself accepting. Fuck you, dad. Your life is mine. But Baal is a god. You cross him, you die. For the first time in over a century, silence falls over the Baal temple. No chants, no screams, no prayers. And so ends the story of Dark Urge. Or does it? I too still hold some power. The skeleton was with us from the beginning, resurrecting our dead companions for a trivial fee. So rise, challenger of gods, and prepare for battle once more. Thanks, Jergal. I wish you could do it without also resurrecting the brain worm. But, you know, gift horse in the mouth and all that. The Elder Brain is located in a giant cave accessible through one of the Undercity passages. There is a problem. The Crown of Carsus wasn't actually designed for the purpose of controlling Illithids. The Absolute fed on the Crown's energies and evolved into Netherbrain. The creature was manipulating the events from the very beginning. It was the one who revealed the secret of the Astral Prism and Prince Orpheus to the Chosen. Even the Emperor unknowingly was the part of its grand design. The brain grew in size and eventually it became so smart that now it knows every action we take before we do. True souls that couldn't be bought, doomed, detected, and caught. It's over. This is not over. Lives, all mortal lives, expire. Souls go to the To defeat the Illithid, we need to think like Illithid, or better yet, turn ourselves into one. By the way, it's actually pronounced Illithid. I've been saying it wrong. So the big choice, do we shed our skin and become a tentacle freak, or do we allow the Emperor to consume Orpheus and wield his power to strike at the nether brain? But there is a third option. The Emperor won't like it. His long-term survival, and perhaps the long-term survival of his species, is incompatible with Orpheus' ambitions. So he sees no other choice but to flee, to be voluntarily assimilated by the Absolute. Is there anyone in this story we haven't betrayed? Turns out Orpheus was perfectly aware of everything that was happening. Gets true air. It is an honor. Do not patronize me. He was imprisoned for thousands of years. This could have gone much worse. One needs to be a lithid to wield the stones. We volunteer Orpheus to make the sacrifice. They don't have penises. The finale. The people we helped in our adventures will show up to repay us. I'm in the mood to crack some skulls after that fuckery in the Temple of Baal. But the bad guys also have reinforcements. This ended up being my favorite final battle in the series. The Emperor shows up riding a dragon. Our imaginary friends are back. I know you. I know everything about you. Well then, you should know better than to land in melee strike range. But what ended up killing the Emperor was Jahira's insect swarm spell, humiliating spellcasters in computer games for 23 years. We could have stopped the Illithid Star Empire together. All you had to do is not torture Orpheus or try to eat his brain. The crown is protected by the dragon, a squad of Emperor's henchmen, as well as three Illithid Arcanists who spam magic missiles. Oh, and the nearby Nautiloid will attack us with artillery. 
On our side, we have the four of us, Orpheus, and the allies we can summon at the press of a button. After the prince uses the stones on their brain, this opens the portal into the mind of the Absolute, and the countdown begins. We are given five turns to DPS the brain until it regains control. From then on, the battle takes place on two arenas simultaneously. And of course, being true to itself, even here at the very end, the game offers us an opportunity to betray everyone and usurp the absolute. We could do it, you know. We could rule the world. Asterion, buddy, Faerun is the kind of place where some sort of magical cataclysm happens once or twice a generation. Relying on magical gimmicks for political power is simply stupid. Baldur's Gate 3, Dungeon and Dragon, motherfuckers live in places that don't exist. Another page in the RPG history book. So it turns out that systems heavy games with a top down camera can sell copies. Well, that took the weight off my shoulders. Not unlike the blobbers they replaced, the isometric RPGs also went out of favor. That happened just a few years after the release of Baldur's Gate 2. Some individuals refer to the subsequent period as the era of RPG death, or the decline. But that's just people being melodramatic. The industry was expanding. More and more bodies from all over the world were assimilated into the video gamer lifestyle. It made sense for the developers to prioritize accessibility above everything else. And it worked. The Mass Effects were some of the first Western AAA RPGs. Many of us were bitter about the triumph of Biojoie. The era of classic isometric RPG masterpieces lasted for six, maybe seven years, and it felt like we had never even begun exploring these ideas before being forced to discard them. The rule of Biojoie remained uncontested until the Kickstarter decade. Baldur's Gate clones were coming back, but they didn't exactly conquer the world. Not until now. And you know what? The blobbers will come back too. I've seen it in the flames. Half of this industry is mobile gaming. And if anything, grid-based dungeon crawlers with tactical combat are better on a phone. So saith the wise Alando. It's time to congratulate our companions on, uh, well, surviving us. No, boo. This moment is for savoring. We can ask Leazel to stay, but I don't want to abort her Dragon Knight career. <laughs> He'll be fine. I have to go! Orpheus doesn't want to live as an abomination and asks us to kill him. <laughs> His last words are... Githka. Support this channel on Patreon. Ugh. Patron credits and that will watch the final scenes. Special thanks to our supporters, including Jim Lawrence, who also provided a copy of the game, 1967 Ford Mustang, I feed my parrot chicken, my next video will be on I Divine Cybermancy, Nathan Kabiska, Miracle Moses Porter, Ganso Bomber Motherfucker, Ilya Rubin, Marching Iron, Dmitri Yu, Eric Lutkehans, Frog, Ray Nurse, Dark Butt Pumpkin, Azazel and Baneful the Doggo, C6, Sidiram Fossil, Snafu, Yuri Slodovnichenko, Source is the best engine ever made, Time to Take Out the Trash, A Two Room Apartment in Babrusk, Belarus, Buck Swope, Danny Kilpatrick, Tony Spagoni, and Hank of the Hill. So we have two post credit scenes. There thou art. Jergal, the lord of the end of everything, stands before the mural of the dead three and talks shit, calling them fools. Vermin away. And then there is the conclusion of Raphael's story. My legions are beginning their assault on Zariel's flying fortress just about now. It will fall before the sun rises over Toril, and Avernus will be mine. Conquering the other hells will be simplicity itself. Hitler's last words. It won't be long before I come knocking at your door. He is talking to the player. Raphael is coming for Earth. 
I can't help but imagine Dr. Breen from City 17, but with a red face and talking in rhyme. Now, I want to go back to the idea of RPG weight class. Larian, the company responsible for the game, has 450 employees and officers in six countries. We don't know what the budget was, but estimates start at 100 million. The budget for Wasteland 3 was around 7 million, and the budget for Pillars of Eternity 1 was under 5 million. Million. This should put things in a perspective. Do not expect a studio the size of In Exile or Obsidian to produce a Baldur's Gate 3. Certainly, do not expect a two-person dev team from Riga, Latvia to produce a Baldur's Gate 3. But there is nothing irrational about demanding the same level of fidelity from other AAA developers with comparable budgets. Perhaps the moneybags will attempt to imitate this game. What if Microsoft gives a hundred million to Sawyer to make super pillars? What if Tencent gives a hundred million to Vince to develop Age of Decadence 2? Perhaps if all of us concentrate on this idea, we can manifest it into being. Oh my god, what if Gazprom gives a hundred million to Cleave to develop Wizardry 9? Booby shag to Shanatar. Shit's looking up. Larian should make Planescape Torment 2. They are perfect for the job. The original game had three flaws. It was too bookish, the color scheme in the first half of the game was bland, and the battles were too simple. And what are the three strengths of Baldur's Gate? Well, they happen to be succinct writing, vibrant visuals, and complex combat. <laughs> Furthermore, some of the characters in this game, like Leia Zell, are of planar nature, and their stories can be continued in Planescape. Seriously, Sven, do it.